killer walks the streets in Cleveland. Once again. And no woman or man is safe. Based on the true crimes of the 1930s, Kingsbury Run Rouge. An 80-year-old unsolved murder case unfolds. We'll follow up on that lead. Chief, you've got to find this guy. You've got to find him fast. Everybody, it is episode 660. Yeah, Cleveland Torso Murderers. Yes, we're going more true crime again. Because, yeah. as you guys know, if you've been listening to the show, uh, my newest book, The Faceless Villain, it's it actually the print version and the ebook might be up by the time this show goes up. I just uploaded the print version today, and it usually takes, you know, a few hours for them to get back to you about the file and whatnot. So um, if it's not up when the show goes up, it'll be up in the next couple of days. Yeah, an audiobook usually takes a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, the audiobook will probably be two more weeks. Uh, the, re- the audiobook is all recorded. Um, I'm just about halfway through editing the sound, and then um, I'll have to upload all of it later. And it usually takes at least 10 days for it to go through quality control yeah. on uh, Audible. So that should be up shortly, but the print in the ebook is, if it's not up already, then it will be up in a day or two. So if you want to check that out, please feel free. And uh, the Cleveland Torso Murders that we are talking about today is actually one of the cases in there. It covers unsolved murders from 1900 to 1959, and it's volume one. There's going to be two more volumes. The uh, second volume will be out probably spring next year. Yeah, and when the audio's ready, we'll give you guys a shout out. And if anybody wants a free sample copy of the audio, just put a comment in the comment section. Is that <laughs> like you like you do? Yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll send you a code. Yeah, because I usually get I usually get twenty five uh, free codes to you know get people to write reviews and stuff like that. So yeah, you can listen to it for free. Patreon patrons will get priority. Yeah. And let's see what else. Oh, our latest movie review that we put up was Total Recall, if you didn't see that. And we'll be doing more of those in the future. We just saw that new Blade Runner last night. Yes, Blade Runner 2049. It was really, really good. Super good. Did not disappoint. I was kind of like, well, when we were going to see it, I was kind of like, well, I'm not going to assume that it's going to suck. But I said, I'll just assume that it'll be okay. Yeah, you know. And then... Sequels usually suck. I went to it thinking, I was saying to Jenny, I said, this shit's going to suck. Yeah, he kept saying that like... Ten minutes into it, I was like, man, this thing's badass. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a huge Blade Runner fan. Yeah. And uh, the movie is true to Blade Runner. It was way, way better than I expected. It I think was it was... Excellent. I think I'm going to say I liked it better than the original. Yeah. It was stuck to... It stuck to the... It was true to the original. It stuck to that concept. Yeah. But it's happening 30 years later. The technology is a little bit better. Yeah. In the uh, in the world, you know. Like, yeah. You know, they've had technological growth also. A bunch of stuff has happened. The world has opened up to show you more of what that world was like, you know. And some of the questions were answered, you know, like... Or kind of answered. It was more like shown. Why they want off-world. Why they're making replicants. What's up with this AI stuff? Yeah. All this stuff comes into play. It's a bigger... They're giving you a bigger picture. Yeah, the, the scope is much larger. Of, of, of the Blade Runner world. And I have to say, too, that visually, it is gorgeous. Knocked it's it just, out of the park. It's stunning. And also, I also want to it give a pra- shout-out, too. A lot of it was practical effects. It was, yeah. And I want to give a shout-out, too, to like the score and the sound yeah. design and stuff like that. That really was good. phenomenal. Yeah, maybe we'll make a special review video yeah, for Yeah, that really, like, lent... I thought that lent a lot to the uh, yeah, overall when, experience. when... When they showed that city for the first time, we were seeing it in IMAX, and that boom, that sound. Yeah. Man, this city was a lot bigger than it was in the first one. Yeah. You know, this there had been a lot of, let's say, urban development. <laughs> They're showing, like, the tops of the buildings, and you're like, wow, look at the tops of those buildings, you know? And then you see this in between where the streets are going, that, God, those buildings must be 20, 20 stories thick. Yeah. And then there's huge skyscrapers above those. 
giant massive things and massive seawalls to hold the ocean back. Yeah. But it was it was awesome. Yeah, it really. I mean, like yeah. you said, you, you said we have to see it again. You can't take it all in at once. Yeah, I mean, you said as soon as it was over, you said that was a fucking masterpiece. It was a masterpiece. It really was. I best think. movie I've seen in ten years. Easy. Yeah, that and Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. I think are the two best movies I've seen recently. Yeah, and I just think in the last they're few two years. very different kind yeah. of movies. Uh, they're both movies of greatness. One is just a great action movie, just action adventure through the whole thing. That's Mad Max. This one's a little more cerebral. It's, it's, uh, makes you kind of uncomfortable. You know, I saw, I felt other people in the audience getting kind of uncomfortable with certain things that were happening in the movie. And I was going, this thing is fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I don't want to, no spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. Don't spoil but, anything. Uh, it, there, there are certain. Because <laughs> I went into it without really, because I didn't want to see trailers. I didn't want to see anything. I just wanted to approach it completely. Because that's how I really like to approach it. A bunch it. of unsettling stuff happens. It really doesn't have a lot to do with gore or anything like that. It's just weird. It's spooky. It's spooky and weird. A lot of the imagery is kind of unsettling. Basically, the, the idea is what is a real person? Anyway, yeah. You know, it's just, you have to see it. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was very philosophical in that right. manner, which I, which I really liked about it. Because I wasn't really expecting that. Things that aren't humans having weird relationships with each other. Stuff, stuff like that. You yeah. Know? But yeah, it's de- I definitely, definitely recommend it. And we definitely yeah. have to see it again. We yeah. might do a special movie review episode. Yeah, on we probably should do a review on it. Yeah. But we're also, probably the next one, like I said, our last one was Total Recall. Probably the next one will be Excalibur. Yeah, I have a lot of we have a lot of Blu-rays. And yeah. We we want to do reviews on all of them. I wanted to do T one too. We have T one and T two. We have so many of them. Yeah. That we've just watched recently. We have we haven't made we haven't made reviews for them yet. Though. Yeah. So well, we'll get around to all. We'll of get them around eventually. to. You know how it goes. Yeah. Okay. So what else? Also, want to remind everybody about our Patreon page. And if you want to go and make a monthly donation, you may do that and get some neat extra stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, If you'd rather just give a one-time donation, if you'd like to support the show, then you can go to our blog, which is 13oclockpodcast.wordpress.com. I wrote it down this time, so I wouldn't mess it up. (laughs) You can go there and there's like a little link in the sidebar that says uh, PayPal donation or whatever it says. I didn't write that. Yeah, plug in Patreon, always, always a pain in the ass, but the thing is we have to do it. Because if not, it just stagnates. And every time we plug Patreon, we get it, pick up, we pick up one or two. Yeah. So, you know, it's just like building up, building any other channel and building any other kind of business. Yeah. You have to start small and you just work at it, you know, patron by patron. You know, if not, then the show won't continue. But at the rate that it's going, I'm, I'm confident that this is going to be, be a really good channel and it'll continue to grow over the years. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And also, um, speaking of Patreon, for our $10 and up patrons um you know we do monthly hangouts the one for october will probably have to be either the october 21st or october 22nd because of spooky empire because of spooky empire usually i would do it on the last weekend of the month we gotta do a convention yeah Yeah. we gotta do spooky empire that's coming up uh the 27th 28th and 29th now i think that i mistakenly on some of our past shows when i was talking about spooky empire yeah I think I mistakenly said that it was at the Orange County Convention Center because that's where it was last year. Oh, it's not there this time? Okay, no. It's at it's at the Hyatt Regency Orlando on oh. International Drive this year. Well, that means we want to actually get air conditioning then. Yeah, that would be rad. Yeah. And Wi-Fi so yeah. I can actually use nice. my... Yeah, so I can use my PayPal thing for and, my phone. And we have a couple of fans, at least one, I think, that are going to be there. Yeah. So make sure you guys bring your phone so you can take pictures. And yeah, there. and it's opening earlier this year. I think it's opening at 1 o'clock on Friday. It doesn't usually open until... Um, Later yeah. in the afternoon. But our first panel, we'll be helming the Sick and Twisted panel, which yeah. is always the most fun panel yeah. of the weekend. And I throw, I throw booze out into the And crowd. we'll be throwing little bottles of booze out to everybody yeah. if you want some little free booze. That'll be at 9 p.m. on Friday night. And we're also going to be on a few of the other panels over the weekend. And we will pretty much be there all day. I mean, we'll be there probably Friday afternoon at yeah. like 3, 4 o'clock. And we'll be there all day Saturday and until closing Sunday. And for all you like pervy single guys out there, there's a lot of cute girls at these. So <laughs> you won't be disappointed. A lot of them are really short skirts, just booty hanging. <laughs> <laughs> what was last time? <laughs> I hope it'll be better this time because it's like, it was yeah. okay at the Orange County Convention Center, but I think it'll probably be better at like an actual hotel. I felt like I was trapped in there and the food wasn't that good. The place was huge though. Huge yeah. and brand new. It's like a huge empty mall. Yeah. If you ever see like Dan Bell's fucking Dead Mall series? Oh yeah, like. we definitely recommend those. Those yeah. that shit is fascinating. Yeah. And I'm not like a big mall person. I didn't hang out in malls so much back in the day. Back. Can you all sit around and just listen to Dead Malls and yeah, we'll just like wave. watch it. Yeah, we're with, gonna, with we're, the vaporwave. We're gonna make music va- going. We've decided to make a vaporwave album, and we're gonna put it out. <laughs> on, 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 we're gonna put it out on the. 
in, in the data stream. We're going to put it out on our show. You guys will like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been talking a great deal about it. Be this. like Gothic Vaporwave. Yeah. It's just like, well, that music is just like so evocative. It just yeah. reminds me of like walking through malls in the Dug 80s. Through balls, it's yeah. like hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, so we're, yeah, we decided to start a vaporwave band. <laughs> yeah. Make a anyway. whole video album. Yeah. Okay. It looked terrible. <laughs> but yeah. in an ironic and cool it, everything way. Everything will be ironic. Yeah. Yes. I know how to do that. Okay. I was alive in the 80s. I remember what that show yeah, was. Yeah. Yeah. We know that music better than those kids making that shit. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, what else? For our Halloween episode. I still need stories. They don't have to be ghost stories, but they have to be true, creepy, scary stories. You got to tell them about those two books that you bought at the mall yesterday. Oh, yeah. That was awesome. We actually went to a mall yesterday, but it wasn't a dead mall. No, it was very, It was actually very crowded. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, because... But did you notice everything was heavily discounted? Well, that's... Well, at Barnes & Noble, that's always been like that. Okay. That's always been like that. All right. You don't... Because I used to hang out in Barnes & Noble years ago. She got a complete hardcover edition of H.P. Lovecraft, and the cover on it looks fantastic. Yeah, it's this huge... Every... Every... Everything that he's written. Fiction that he's written. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have, like, his essays on the Supernatural, but it has all of his fiction in it. Yeah. The novels and everything. Yeah. And it's in this big big huge hardback book with silver on the side of the pages yeah. it's so gorgeous yeah i think it was, what was it like 20 bucks or something yeah like what that? was the other one yeah and the other one is like a big giant uh, i think it's 101 of the best like supernatural stories yeah. of all time they had some action like fi- fiction they had some action figures there i wanted to buy actually they had like a japanese version of darth vader darth vader as yeah, a like samurai. a samurai yeah they were badass yeah they were expensive though it's like 100 bucks each one of them and then like the red they were imp- big though the, the red imperial guards yeah but they were dressed like as a, samurai like a samurai version and then like stormtroopers but yeah. they're samurai it was weird. i had never seen those before Me but neither. i saw them and i'm like man that kind, is, what a good idea some kind of an official star wars pro- Product, but just rebooted as Japanese samurais. Yeah, pretty neat. Yeah, they were they were badass. Looking. I think they were metal, weren't they? Die oh, cast? I don't know. Well, well they if were they were die- well, if they were diecast, then I don't mind them being hundred dollars. Maybe some of it was diecast. I don't know yeah. if I'd pay hundred bucks even for a nice plastic figure. I got to have some of that nineteen seventies Shigokin metal. Yeah, I don't right know how much you love that. My stuff. Japanese robots, man, they're metal. <laughs> Like he has Shogun a whole Warriors he has something. a whole collection of Japanese robots. If you grew up with Shogun Warriors, I got the real things. I got the ones from Japan, the Bandai versions. Of yeah, them, fully articulated. They're very cool. Yeah, he has a shit ton. A friend of mine makes them. Yeah, from a company called HL Pro. But anyway, well, yeah, and then oh, I got one more shout out. Uh, my friend Damian Lee Thor wanted me to shout out his power metal band called Predator. Who we also did the movie review on that. Yeah, okay. He has a band called Predator. So check out their website at www.predatortheband.com. You can put, sure put a link. put a link. Yeah, I'm sure he would appreciate it. And okay, so I think that's all the shout outs, right? Yeah, we're 12 minutes into this. we got to get start talking about this. All right. So today we are talking about the Cleveland Torso Murders. Probably one of the creepiest, for sure, like the grossest series of unsolved murders in American history. When was this? This was the 1930s. 1930s. I don't know anything about this, so I'm going to be now, the audience. I'm the audience in this one. Yeah. Now, okay. officially, the Cleveland Torso murderer only killed, only killed, 12 people. Right. But it could be as many as 20 because there were a shit ton of other similar crimes that might have been him. And this spanned like several years. It was between like 1921 and 1950 were, you know, some murders that could have been him. Although his main his main window of crime was in the night like mid nineteen thirties. Okay, they just find torsos. Well, and other parts. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get to it. All right. So let's set the stage. Cleveland, Ohio, in the nineteen thirties. Obviously, post depression. Cleveland was kind of starting to make a little bit of a comeback, though. Like some of the factories started hiring again and things like that. And, you know, a lot of people were coming into the city to get work in the steel factories. But there was still, you know, because so many people were coming into the city and stuff, there was still a great deal of poverty and and, uh, homelessness. So in Cleveland, there's um, a part of Cleveland, uh, I think it's on the southeast of the city, called Kingsbury Run. And in Kings, within Kingsbury Run, there was kind of like a shanty town or like, you know, ho- hobo camps that are called the Flats or the Cleveland Flats. Now, it was within this area that it seems like this murderer, whatever his motives were, took most of his victims. It should be noted that almost all of his victims were unidentified. 
uh, the killer himself was also unidentified. Mm. I don't think he's still running around out there because it was the 1930s, but you never yeah. know. He might be like, there might be an old guy like chopping people up out there. It always kind of trips me out how this heinous shit's going down like in the 20s and the 30s. We always tend to look back at those times as like they were innocent, more simple times. But no, no, people were bad back then. Man. Well, that's what I mean. And like, and this is the thing too. Like, remember we were watching that thing that was kind of like other crimes that happened in England, uh, like aside yeah. from Jack the Ripper, like in the late 19th century. Yeah. And also when I was researching the faceless villain, and like I said, that goes from, you know, 1900 to 1959. And there were some really fucking horrible crimes that happened yeah. back then. I mean, people just like chopping people up with axes. It's like people yeah. leaving heads. Places. It's like there's fucking always, nasty ass shit. There's always a certain amount of the population that is just evil. Yeah. I wonder if it had something to do with, you know, like mercury poisoning and weird, uh, all the toxins. It might have had something to do with lead because lead, mercury, um, lead yeah. in paint and lead in the yeah. water supply and stuff like that. That yeah. does um, mess up the frontal lobe of your brain. Right. Which that's your inhibition and all that other yeah. Yeah, a lot, of people, a lot of people are always talking about how polluted it is and, and shit. No, and this it, well, not compared to not back compared then. to the way it was. Yeah, it's not not compared to the way it was back in the early seventies when I was a kid. I can remember just gagging in my eyes. Yeah, the and smog burning used on to be smog. really bad, and that's that's not. Well, they've anymore. cleaned it up a lot. It's since changed then. a lot. Remember that there used to be like uh, down the ditches of fucking trash and garbage everywhere. Yeah. Now you look at China, and China's like that now. But we used to be like that back in the 70s. Yeah, and I think a lot China's of people do forget polluted. that. Yeah, I mean, right. it was a lot grosser back in the day. Yeah. For real. <laughs> they, had, they had the commercial of the Indian guy crying. Yeah. Remember that? That Remember guy that? wasn't even an Indian. No, he was. He's Italian, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Sicilian, I think he's Sicilian. Sicilian. Yeah. Iron Eyes Cody. But yeah, yeah, he played Indians like his whole career, but he wasn't even Native yeah. American. He was just, he was a Sicilian dude. TV's fake. Well, you know. <laughs> okay. So picture this. It's 1934, September 5th. And there's this guy and he's walking on the shores of Lake Erie on Euclid Beach. And what does he stumble across? But the lower half of a woman's torso from waist to knees. Damn. Just laying there on the shore. Obviously the police are called and shit like that. And this woman, I think that was the only part of her that they ever found. Now the weirdest thing about this was that the skin on it was kind of like red and tough, like leathery. Yeah, like some here. kind of preservative had been yeah, applied Yeah, I'm getting to. suspicious already. Think about that. You know, it's very portable. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like some dude's making like a portable sex toy yeah. out of a woman's lower, bo- lower, well, lower half of her body. Well, the, the thing is, though, that other pieces of other bodies were found. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, ju- they call them the Cleveland Torso Murderer, but that's because, yeah, they found torsos, but they found other shit, too. Right. You know what I mean? It just sounds like some dude is trying to, you know, basically make a, make a giant pocket pussy or something else. <laughs> I mean, that's nasty. <laughs> nasty. Remember when we get into the, into, into the, when we were talking, get to about the cannibal and the necrophilia. On the necrophilia show. Yeah. I get Still to, some I, people's favorite episode because Tom yeah, got so gross. <laughs> I start, I start to have these mental problems when people talk about this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Because it starts to become mentally real to me. I'm, I'm like, well, it myself, is real. It didn't yeah, really happen. Yeah. I, and I, they, like I said, they never caught this dude. Right. I don't like it. Yeah. So this woman, okay, so they never found the head. They never found any of the other pieces. And they never identified who this was. And they didn't know how long that she had been dead because of the, they thought some kind of preservative was on the skin. Man, I guess it was, I guess it was weird back then. You could kill a person and that person could disappear and nobody would even know that the person was missing. Yeah. Because paperwork was so disorganized. Yeah. If that was somebody from another state, the family would be in that other state looking for that person. Yeah. And I think that happened a lot. And like I said, I think it happened with a lot of the victims of this murder in particular right. because so many people had come into the city looking for work and they were poor. Right. You know, they just lived in these shanty towns and stuff like that. So if you, they got snatched and got killed, that was it. You that was it. it. You would never know, Damn. you know, and most of the time they never found their heads. Right. So, you know, they didn't Good know what idea. they look like or anything right. like that. So now this woman that was found, this partial woman, there is some controversy over whether this was actually the Cleveland torso murders first victim or not. Most researchers think it was, but they're not entirely certain. And this was 1934. So they call her either victim one or victim zero because they're not really sure. Now, the first victim that is canonical, Mm -hmm. let's say, this happened more than a year later. It was September 23rd, and this was 1935. And this is an area of Kingsbury Run that's known as Jackass Hill. I don't know why. (laughs) Maybe somebody from Ohio can clue me in. And this time they found Chicken. Jackass Hill. I'm sure there's, there's I'm sure there's, I'm a, sure story, there's a good story there's behind a story that. Behind and if anybody somewhere. from Ohio knows, please tell me. 
But you um, jackass, it had something to do with that hill. <laughs> so you jackass, some jackass lived some on some jackass that hill. did something, <laughs> or fell down that hill, or did something, or you tricked somebody to ride ride down that hill on one of those little land sleighs, you know, something like that. <laughs> you need to name shit. Yeah, I, I can name, I name shit all the time. Yeah, you do. So this time there were two victims, and both of them were men. Both were decapitated, and both were also emasculated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer style. Yeah, let's call it that. Now, both of these guys, they did find their heads right. not attached, but they found them a little way away. One of the victims, the one that was older, had leathery skin, kind of like the lady in the lake. So somebody had put some kind of chemical on there. Trying to preserve them. Yeah. This victim was not identified. The other victim, it was a younger guy. And this body had been washed and drained of blood. All right. And had rope burns on his wrists. Now, they found his head, so they were able to... he was alive. Yeah, they were able to identify this guy. His name was Edward Andrissy. And he was uh, a young gay man, and he had frequented some of the bars in the area and stuff like that. So he was recognized. They found him. They thought that he had only been dead for a few days. The other body, which was an older man, um, they thought he had been dead for several weeks, although they weren't certain about that. The interesting thing, and I guess it's easy to say this in hindsight, but at first they kind of treated this double murder as a separate crime. Like it didn't really seem to occur to them that maybe it was the same guy that did the Lady of the Lake, which actually kind of, that kind of upsets me because it's like, oh, well, so it's just like run of the mill that there's some dude like running around lopping off people's heads and chopping people's yeah. bodies up and stuff like that, that that didn't even occur to them that that might have been the same guy. Right. I mean, it was only like a little more than a year between those two things. Right. So you think people would be like, oh, hey, you know, we found that piece of that body, but right. whatever. So well, then like They hadn't what? identified what a, what a serial killer was by that time. You know, there wasn't an FBI, I don't think, in the 1930s, was there? Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. It there was just, I don't think it was killer. called the FBI. Yeah, though. and I don't think there was a serial killer task force. So yeah. So this concept that someone would kill pers- people over and over just again. Just for the hell of it. For, for sexual me- Or for sexual reasons. Purposes over periods of years. I don't think that had really sunk in. Yeah. So the next one that took place that was probably the same person... This was January of 1936, and there was a woman, and she was walking by the Hart Manufacturing Building in Cleveland, and she found two baskets, and she looks in the baskets for whatever reason, I don't know, and inside the baskets, there was a dismembered woman, and each piece had been very neatly wrapped in newspaper. Nice. Yeah. Uh, They never found this woman's head. However, um, they did, they were able to take fingerprints off of the body and they identified the woman as Florence Palillo, who was a bartender and sometime prostitute. They thought she had been dead about two to four days. Four months later, two little boys walking near the East 55th Street Bridge. They come across a pair of pants. Inside this pair of pants is a severed head. The next day, they found the rest of the corpse. And it was, uh dumped in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Precinct. This man was also a younger guy. Uh, His body had also been washed and drained of blood. Probably been dead for two days. They figured he had been decapitated while he was still alive. Hmm. Some of the bodies were not. Some of the bodies were cut up post-mortem. But this one, they think he was decapitated while he was still alive. Now, this guy, they never identified him either. They ended up calling him the Tattooed Man because he had six distinctive tattoos. Uh, One of them had the name Helen and Paul on it, and one said WCG. They said they also found, like, inside his underwear, there was a laundry mark that had the initials JD on it. So they assumed that that was the guy's initials. Now, they made um, a death mask of him, and they put the death mask on display in 1936 in the summer at the Great Lakes Exposition to see if anyone could identify him. Mm. But nobody did. Like, no one ever came forward. So they still don't know who this guy is. He's just called the Tattooed Man, another unidentified victim. Then another month goes by, July 1936. And then there's a girl walking through the woods. And she finds the beheaded body of a 40-year-old man. Now, this guy looked like he'd been dead a long time. Like, he looked kind of leathery also. They did find his head and a pile of bloody clothing. Now, they think this guy was killed at that spot in the woods because they said they were able to determine, like, the ground underneath him was, like, 
saturated or like soaked with blood still. Yeah, he's doing two things. He's killing them in secluded spots and cutting their heads off when he can. When he can't do it that way, he gets them into some place secluded like his house. Yeah. Kill, rapes and kills them. But then he has to cut them up into little pieces and wrap them up to take them out of there, to transport them out of there safely without yeah. being seen. That's that's why that's why you're finding some of them in pieces and some of them pretty much whole. Yeah. You have to cut them up in order to carry them out of the house. Well, yeah. Because otherwise, obviously, yeah, that's obvious. a body. <laughs> so, yeah, he's packing them up in boxes. He's just saying, yeah, this is just some uh, meat I bought at the butcher. You can't carry it all out at once sometimes. So sometimes they'll take half of it out or one third of it out in one box and then a day later take the other one third out. Yeah. So he's not attracting attention. So that means that he lives, he has privacy, but he lives in a populated area. Someplace that's where- kind of what I feel because... This is the type of thing, and th- it, I just thought of Silence of the Lambs, where they said that, you know, he, how, uh, what's his name, the killer in it, mm-hmm. like, kept the girls in the basement and starved them and stuff like that. So he needed privacy and he needed a big area. Yeah. It seems like this guy had to have that, too. Yeah. Because if he was just, like, hacking people up in the street or even, like, somewhere around where he lives, you'd think that he would be seen. Yeah. No one, it's weird because no one seems to have ever seen anyone. Well, he got that one guy in the woods. Yeah. Killed him, cut his head off. Yeah. He's usually able to get them into his house. Yeah. Or a place of work. Yeah. It's got to be something like that. And, you know, because, I mean, that's not, that's kind of a big deal. Like, you know, luring these people and then cutting them up into pieces and then you have to wrap them up and you're taking them out. He's he's luring them in there under a ruse. Some of them are prostitutes. Some of them are probably people that are looking for work. Yeah. So he's probably taking some of them to his house or he's taking them to a place where he works. Yeah. Or he has access to a place where he works. Right. Maybe uh, he doesn't own the place, but he has the keys. Yeah. You know, like a warehouse. Like or, a warehouse. Yeah, or, or something, something like, like that. that. And it's it's actually kind of disturbing because, like I said, when I was researching the book, there were an alarming amount of crimes back in the 20s and 30s and stuff like that where people, both men and women were lured to their killer because they were looking for jobs. Like they yeah. answered ads in the paper. They still do it today. Or, Craigslist type Yeah, stuff. or somebody, you know, said, right. like, one, I remember one girl, like, you know, she said somebody from the college, oh, they recommended you as a secretarial job. And, you know, what do you know? You're just like, right, oh, yeah. cool, I need a job. And then they fucking kill you. Right. That sucks, man. So, yeah, I think that's probably what happened here. So this guy, the guy they found in the woods, they also never identified that guy, even though they did find his head. And then there was another one on September 10th. And this one was actually found by a homeless man and he was hopping a train and he tripped over the upper part of a torso, which has got to be kind of a shitty way to start your day. (laughs) (laughs) It's bad enough I'm homeless and have to like jump trains and now I'm like (laughs) tripping over fucking body parts in the road. Yeah, Yeah, but he went to the cops and the cops probably gave him some coffee and some donuts. I hope so. They better have. Let him sleep at the station house. and Yeah. So yeah, so they found a windfall for a bum. (laughs) I guess he's like, woohoo, it's my lucky day tripping (laughs) over a body. Ah, that's so horrible. Okay, so he find they found the upper part of the torso. Now they searched around and they were able to find the bottom half of the torso and they found the legs in a sewer nearby. Uh, They didn't find the head or the arms of this one and uh, also not identified. Now at this point, they finally figured out, oh, it's a serial killer. So they have two full-time detectives that they put on the case who are Peter Marillo and Martin Zaleski. And finally, the press has dubbed this killer the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of an alternate name. Like, I think later on, he kind of got known more popularly as the Cleveland Torso Murderer. But at the time, he was known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. And they really had no idea who the fuck this could be. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, they had no leads. No suspects, no nothing. They just knew that there was this crazy person and they were picking off poor people from this one area and cutting them up and leaving them for reasons unknown. And that's kind of all they knew. And they only, they had two full-time detectives on it and they kind of started trying to figure out who it was. Let's take a break right now because we're at the halfway point and then we'll come back and talk about the rest of the murders and also talk about some of the other related murders that might have been the same person. And we will be back in just a few minutes.
Hey, 13 o'clock fans. Love the show, but don't have an hour to spare? Check out our new list channel, 13 o'clock in minutes. All the fun, creepy topics of the main podcast, but in easy to swallow bite-sized pieces. Links in the description. More videos to come soon. Okay, and we're back talking about the Cleveland Torso Murderer, a.k.a. the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Now, the next victim did not come along until the following year, February 23rd, 1937. Interestingly, this body was found on Euclid Beach by Lake Erie, which was the same place that the Lady of the Lake was found, which is why I tend to think, because like I said, some researchers think that maybe the Lady of the Lake wasn't one of one of uh, Cleveland Torso Murderer's victims, but I tend to think probably because, you know, how often do you have, like, them dumping in the same area? Yeah. But uh, this was also a woman. Now, this was the upper half of a woman's torso that was found uh, floating there. And all they could figure out about this woman was that she was about in her mid-20s. Uh, her head had been cut off after she was dead, not before. They didn't ever find the head, although they did find the lower half of her torso about three months later. It washed ashore a few miles away. The next one happened in June. Well, it didn't happen in June. It was found in June. There was a boy and he was uh, kind of messing around underneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge and he found a skull. And near the skull, there was also a burlap sack and the burlap sack had the rest of the skeleton in it, except for one rib for Mm. some reason. I don't know. Maybe the killer kept it for a souvenir. Who knows? So there was one rib missing, but the rest of the skeleton was in there. Now they figured this, this person must have been dead for at least a year. And I don't know where it was uh, since then. Now, they looked at the teeth and they thought that maybe comparing dental records that this might have been a woman named Rose Wallace. Now, Rose Wallace had been missing for 10 months. So they had her son come and look at the skull and look at the teeth and stuff like that. And he said, yeah, I think that's my mom. But see, the dentist who had worked on Rose Wallace was dead. So they couldn't get him to come in and corroborate and stuff like that. And some cops were saying, well, we think this body is older than 10 months Hmm. old, so it might not be her. But, you know, it might have been. Her son seemed to think it was her. But so that may be identified, maybe not. Now, the next thing that happened over the summer, there were a bunch of like labor strikes and riots and stuff like that in the in the flats. And the National Guard was called in to kind of try to keep order or whatever. And early July, one of the National Guardsmen was standing around the Cuyahoga River and a tugboat went by and he saw something weird like in the wake of the tugboat. So they went in there to see what it was and it turned out that it was a piece of another body. Mm. And this was a man in his mid-30s and he'd only been dead for a couple of days. And so, you know, the authorities dredged the river and they found most of the rest of the body, except for the head. And so they never identified this guy either. And after that, things seemed to settle down for a little while. They didn't find another body until the following year. Uh, It was April 8th, 1938. And there was a guy and he was uh, walking to work and he saw something on the banks of the Cuyahoga River that at first he thought was a dead fish. And as he got closer to it, he discovered that it was actually the lower half of a woman's leg. So the police were searching all around looking for the rest of the body, but it took about a month before they found most of the rest of it. They also found a thigh that was from the same body that was in the river. And then they found two burlap sacks, like under a bridge or something like that. And that had the other thigh, uh, the left foot, and the two severed halves of the torso. Again, arms and head, never found. Now, this woman, when they did an autopsy on her, they actually found drugs in her system. So they, this was the only victim that had drugs in their system. So they said, we don't know if she was a drug addict, 
because, you know, obviously they never found her arms, so they didn't know yeah. if she had track marks or what have you. Or if the drugs were given to her by the killer, maybe to immobilize her or for whatever reason. So that was kind of an interesting, that was the only one that was found like that. It's unlikely. It's more likely that she was just a drug addict. Yeah, she might have been a drug addict. But like I said, she was the only... Uh, I'm just having a weird feeling, you know, that this is a guy that has the ability or at least appears to have the ability to offer people jobs. Yeah. That's what I think's happening. Is the victimology, it's about 50-50 male-female. Yeah. So you're dealing with a bisexual guy. Yeah. And he's uh, offering people that he likes jobs, getting them into a place, raping and killing them. What's going down with the men, those men are probably fighting back. That's why, you know, some of them are getting their heads cut off while they're alive, you know, that type of shit. Yeah. Uh, some of them are gay, some of them are straight. Yeah. You know, he's just going to take it. He doesn't care if you're straight. Yeah, he just seems a yeah. very opportunistic yeah. I mean, he just seems to be taking anybody that will come to him. Oh, he's a booty bandit. <laughs> he's a booty bandit. He's going to take it. He he's far worse he than a booty he bandit. Doesn't, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you're, if you're straight. He's going to take the. He's going to take it from you. And then he's going to chop. He's you going to kill you if you resist. Yeah. So uh, he's a bad dude. Yeah. yeah. I'm still. What it's almost like guys that do this kind of shit. Yeah. It's almost like. I can't even imagine that being a person, like a human being. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's I know, like a demon. Yeah. But like, I know that that's bad yeah. because obviously, you know, yes, humans are capable of doing horrible things. It's going to be a dude like John Wayne Gacy type of guy, you know what I mean? Where they get you, they, they, they get you in a spot and they, then they somehow, you know, are able to handcuff you or get an advantage over you. Yeah. Then they start messing with you and fucking with you and calling you a fag and this and that and beating you up and then hate and sex start coming in together and then he rapes you and then kills you. Yeah. And that's evidently how John Wayne Gacy was. Only I think one guy survived him because he begged his way out of it. Yeah. But during the whole thing, it was more like a fight than yeah. it was. It was like a fight with torture and rape involved in it. And then, you know, he cut your throat or strangled you to death, stuff yeah. like that. So, you know, the, the, I think the, the main, the main emotion behind this kind of shit is hate. Yeah. It's not... Well, it's gotta be. It's not so much lust, it's just hatred. Yeah. And like I said, and it's I like think... A, it's like a blood lust. Yeah. yeah. And I think it doesn't help, too, that this this guy especially, I mean, this guy was never caught. And yeah. they really barely had any idea of who yeah. it could have been. I mean, there are very, very few suspects of who right. it could have been. So it's like, you, so you don't have anything to get a handle on. Right. Like, you know, John Wayne Casey, you know what that guy looks like. Yeah. Even though you're always kind of surprised when you see somebody that does yeah. these horrible things and they finally catch them, you're like, that's it? That's right. it's that guy? I don't know. You're just like expecting him to have horns or something. I don't right. know. <laughs> I know that's stupid, but yeah. So, okay. Now, the last canonical Cleveland Torso murder victim uh, was found on August 16th. Actually, it was two victims. So there were some workers and they were kind of scrounging through a dump, like looking for scrap and stuff like that that they could sell. And they found an old quilt that was wrapped around something. And they unwrapped it. The, inside the quilt, there was a man's double-breasted jacket. And inside this jacket was yet another woman's torso. So the police came and started going through the dump and everything like that. Now they found a box near where the torso was found and it had a pair of legs and a pair of arms that had been wrapped in butcher paper and bound together with rubber bands. They found the head also. And they said, now this one was interesting because they said it looked like, I mean, according to uh, the coroner, he thought that this body had been refrigerated for some time. So they weren't quite sure how long this one had been yeah, that's dead. Yeah, typical, typical shit. They said this had probably, she had maybe been dead four to six months, but maybe refrigerated. So if he gets one that he likes and he has the opportunity to put her in a refrigerator. And keep her. And use her a couple, use her. Use yeah, her. maybe that's that what was, it was. Oh yeah, that's yeah. what, what's his name? There, there's been several. Yeah, Goddammer did that too, didn't he? Yeah, they yeah. tried to preserve them and keep them fresh. And that Dennis, um, Dennis Nelson too, didn't he do that shit? Um. Well, yeah, a lot of them try, you yeah. know, and then you have the Green River Killer. He didn't, he'd go back to him. He didn't care if they were rotten or not. He, he liked them rotten. Special. And then uh, Ted Bundy did was the same way, too. He'd go, he'd try to keep them fresh when he could. He'd go back to them, you know. Put them in Tupperware. He, the thing is, is that he wasn't always in the, he wasn't always in a position to preserve the whole body. So Bundy would save the heads. and He'd put the heads in the refrigerator. He'd and have you, sex yeah, with just Yeah, you the know head. what he was going to do with yep. those. Yeah, so... When they have the opportunity, they do stuff like that. They you guys are fucking gross. Yeah. It's so gross. 
It's not you guys. It's not, not you guys. No, I mean, <laughs> if I'm talking to that's, anybody else, that's that necrophilia does. crap. Yeah, that's some disgusting and, shit. And, uh, you know, this whole concept of cutting heads off usually involves, well, a head small enough to fit in a refrigerator. Yeah. But he would put some of their, you know, Bundy would put heads up on mantles and yell at them and then put them back in the refrigerator. You know, he was, you know, these people are oh, fucking nuts. <laughs> no shit. Okay, they're not normal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, as if this wasn't bad enough, finding a four to six month old cut up corpse that had been refrigerated, mm-hmm. finding it in the dump, they're looking through the dump for more pieces and they come across another body. This was a headless man. Now, nearby, they found a big can that had the man's head in it. Yeah. So, this guy, they thought he had been dead for quite a while, like longer than six months for sure. They think he was killed sometime between November 1937 and January 1938. He definitely had a decapitation fetish. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Because I think pretty all of the victims were decapitated, at least. Yeah. Most of the male victims were also, their dicks were cut off. Yeah, to make them women. Yeah. And um, his mind, yeah, some yeah. of them were cut up entire leg, were cut, yeah. the torsos were cut in half, or the legs were cut off, the arms were cut off, all that kind of shit. Um, a few, like I said, a few times, especially with the men, they would find the body yeah. and the head separate. Right. But for some reason, most of the time, he just like cut them up into pieces. Now, this is kind of where I think the Cleveland Torso Murders and, you know, Special Agent Elliot Ness, the famous of the Untouchables, I think these two things kind of became a lot more entwined than they actually were. Now, Elliot Ness was kind of sort of tangentially somewhat associated with the case. Like he did interview a couple of the suspects and stuff. Now, he was particularly pissed off by these particular two victims because this dump site was like within view of his office window. So he almost kind of felt like the killer was like taunting him or something by like leaving them there. Like, hey, Hmm. Elliot Ness, come get me. Because I mean, (laughs) Elliot Ness was quite famous at the time. So because Elliot Ness was so pissed off about this and was pissed off that the police had not been able to catch this psycho, a couple of days after these two bodies were found, he's like, you know what? We are going to go to the Cleveland Flats and we are just going to fucking torch it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, which I don't know if you'd be able to do that nowadays, but like back then they gave no fucks, I guess. So Ness goes down to the hobo camps of the shantytown And he's got like fire trucks, police vans, squad cars, everything like that. They scooped up 60 dudes Mm -hmm. just cause like, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you're a suspect, you're a suspect, you're a suspect, get in the van. And then they got everybody out and they just fucking torched the whole thing and they burned the whole thing to the ground. It's always funny back in those days, they would suspect people that really had no means to commit these kind of crimes. Yeah. This was a middle class guy probably. Yeah. Well, I kind of feel like back in the day, like they didn't really have, you know, it's not great now, but at least we have like DNA and we have like, you know, CCTV cameras and shit like that. Back then they didn't have any of that shit. So it's like, I kind of feel like, and in a lot of cases that I investigated for the book, I was sitting there, there's just really this sense of like desperation where they were just kind of like anybody, it doesn't matter. Just were you there? Were you, okay, you, you're under arrest. You know what I mean? They go after these transient guys that don't have a pot to piss in and no place really to do this. Right. You know, they haven't even been in the area long enough and they start kind of scrutinizing those guys. Yeah. This was some kind of local business owner. Doing that. It probably was, like I said, yeah. because it had to be somebody with, like you said, the means. They had yeah. to have some kind of privacy. Yeah. Something like that. And like you said, it had to be somebody with the means to, like, lure people yeah. to some It was somebody location. offering jobs. Yeah. That that does really seem like the most likely yeah. scenario. So, you know, so Elliot Ness, he's burned the whole area down. Now, obviously, even back then, people were like, now, that was a little much. Okay, you didn't need to do all that. It should be noted that none of the people they picked up during this raid, mm-hmm. they were all later released because they said none of, none of them right. were considered a viable suspect. However, it does seem as though burning down the Cleveland Flats did, they think, stop the crimes because they don't think there were, there were no more canonical murders after that. Right. So they don't know if the guy lived there or if he just said, fuck it, I'm moving somewhere else where it's well, easier pickings well, or whatever. That may have been his... Prey pool. Source. Well, it was. They right. know that for sure. So once they're gone, he doesn't have anybody to, to offer yeah. jobs to. Right. That's what I think it was. Now it I should think it was be a small business owner, somebody yeah. that owns a, owned a little shop or owned a little warehouse or maybe like a small mechanic or something like that. Something dumb. Something you'd never really. Yeah, and it should be noticed. noted too that there were some that yeah. I'm going to talk about in a minute, but there were some crimes too that took place later, like in a different area that might have been the same guy. So yeah. there is some evidence to suggest that after that big fire, he just thought, oh, well, 
that's that's a wrap. I'm going to go somewhere else and start doing this shit. Yeah. Now, Ness, as well as many other researchers into the case, one of their main suspects was this guy named Dr. Francis Sweeney. He had actually been a medic in World War I, and he was arrested, and Elliot Ness interviewed him. Now, Sweeney failed two polygraph tests, although... I mean, polygraph tests are not all that accurate now, and they were even less accurate back in the 30s, um, but they did find it suspicious that he had failed two of them, and Elliot Ness did think that Francis Sweeney was probably the killer. However, he never really got a chance to prosecute him because Sweeney was related to Elliot Ness's political rival, as well as the sheriff of Cleveland. Huh. So yeah. he never got... Uh, he never got tried for any of that. Why would Sweeney have had motive? Did he have a, did he have some kind of a psychological Well, now, now see what happened later on was that Dr. Sweeney actually voluntarily committed himself okay. to a mental asylum later on. And he was actually in a mental asylum until he died in the 60s. That doesn't make you a serial killer. Really. I know, but that's, that's what I mean. But I'm saying Elliot Ness thought that was him, but who knows? Yeah. And um, the weird thing too is that after they put him, after he put himself in the mental asylum, <laughs> He spent the next several years like writing taunting postcards to Elliot Ness and his family. About like, the murders? I or? don't know what it was. Just huh. like saying he sucked. I don't know what they said exactly. Right. But I was like, that seems like a weird way to spend his time, but whatever. Now, the only other guy that was actually picked up for this. In 1939, they arrested a 52-year-old man named Frank Dolezal. And they arrested him in conjunction with the murder of Florence Palillo, who was considered the third or the fourth Cleveland Torso murder victim. That's right. considering whether you take Lady in the Lake into the uh, and tally. Right. Now, Dolezal initially did say that he had killed Florence, although he said it was self-defense. Like, she started a fight with me, and she yeah. was hurting me and stuff, and then so I killed her. And he made a bunch of confessions, but then later he recanted them because he said that the cops had beaten the confession out of him. It could be possible. Yeah. Now, six weeks after he was arrested, they found him hanging in his cell, an apparent, quote unquote, suicide. Yeah, I mean, However, sounds... some sources say mm. that he had a bunch of broken ribs that right. were not there when he was arrested. Right. They sounds So he might have been right that they yeah. beat that shit out of him. Right. So they don't know. I mean, I think even nowadays, I think most researchers get, researchers are saying, no, that wasn't the Cleveland Torso. I bet you they didn't even come close to catching this guy. I don't think they did. Because check this shit out. Like I said, his official tally is 12, 13 if the Lady in the Lake is counted. However, there were a bunch of similar crimes that took place spanning 1921 to 1950 that could have also been him. Like... In 1936, July of 1936, they found a headless man in a boxcar in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. They also found three headless bodies in other boxcars in a place called McKee's Rocks, Pennsylvania. And that was in 1940. And these were all very similar, the way they found the bodies, very similar situation, very similar wounds. Mm. They also found a bunch of dismembered bodies in the swamps near Newcastle, Pennsylvania, between 1921 and 1934, and again between 1939 and 1942. You know, now I'm starting to change my theory. Maybe he could have been one of those vagrants in that camp. Maybe. And then when they brought well, the camp down, he traveled and moved with them all yeah. uh, across the U.S. He ends up uh, being a railroad hobo. Yeah. Cuts well, off some yeah. of their heads. And then he stops being a railroad hobo and maybe joins some kind of camp somewhere in the swamps. You know, it may have been something like that. Yeah, so... Um, but the thing is, is, man, you have to have privacy to do what he's doing. Yeah, that's what I mean. Unless you really know the lay of the land. Right. And he's showing these bodies off. He's putting them back where they can be found. He's advertising. He's not hiding the bodies. Not really. No. I mean, you know, most of them... I mean, it's some of them... you hide a body. Some of them, yeah, some of them weren't found for a long time, but it's like if you're just throwing them in the water, obviously... That's not hiding them. Yes, yeah, that's going to wash up somewhere yep. eventually. So in 1940, there was an article in this uh, in the Newcastle News in Pennsylvania, and they called this killer the murder swamp killer. But they think this might be the same dude. Now, mm -hmm. in 1950, there was also a man named Robert Robertson. This guy was uh, was identified and they found him decapitated. Now, that was back in Cleveland. Hmm. So this also might have been the same guy. So this right. guy might have been doing this like he went to Cleveland, he went to Pennsylvania, then he right. went back to Cleveland and was like chopping people's heads off all over the place. He's an old head chopper. Yeah. So 
what the now the main one of the main investigators on the Cleveland Torso murder case, Peter Marillo. And this guy, there's actually a picture of him, and I'll put it in the YouTube video because I found it. But there's a picture of him like dressed up like a like a classic like Halloween costume hobo with like the hat and the little yeah. the bindle and everything. Yeah. And he would go undercover as a hobo. Mm-hmm. And he thought that probably all these other murders that took place in Pennsylvania, he thought this was the same guy because he pointed out he's like there was a railroad. Um, the Baltimore and Ohio railroad line that went between Cleveland and Philadelphia. Yes. He's riding trains twice a day. Yeah. So he thinks that, you know, this guy was just riding back and forth and like fucking killing people or whatever. Yeah. Now there is also, uh, the same guy, Peter Marillo, the investigator. He also thought that the same guy who did the Cleveland torso murder murders also killed the black Dahlia. Because she was likewise cut in half. Uh, yeah, but I'm, uh, not, I don't no, know about that. I don't think so. I mean, I think that yeah, it was similar. But I to me, that seems like the only thing that was similar Black, about Black that crime. Dahlia was not. A, she, she was not a transient. She was not nowhere near close to a bomb. No, this and is, this was this way is far like away. bum on bum violence that we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, well, this, what I mean, her is, said that took place way out in Hollywood, man. Yeah, that was like way out right. in California. Yeah. It's like that really doesn't seem. I mean, yes, whoever she was this guy is, half, that's not his scene. But she wasn't beheaded. Yeah, she wasn't. I mean, her fucking pubic hair was picked out one by one by hand. That is yeah. like that is a fucking yeah. Yeah, I mean. Well, he was. Uh, that was not his scene. Right. No. So I don't whoever think that this, that's probably what it is. Whoever was do- doing this was connected to hobo camps and connected to railroads. Yeah, that's kind of my yeah. feeling about it. Whether he was like a quote unquote bum himself, or I kind of doubt it. Maybe he was a little above bum status. Yeah, maybe he like actually maybe had a house. Step maybe, above it, maybe, maybe you know, maybe he was like still working class, Might but not like homeless. with the bums. Yeah, something or like, like you that. said, maybe he was like a working class guy who owned a small shop or something right, like yeah. that, and, where and, or had some place where he could do that kind yeah, of. Yeah, and where he could make contact with bums and offer them things and kill. Them. Yeah. Although it should it should be noted that there's one guy, his name's Jack Anderson Wilson, also known as Arnold Smith, and he was not only a suspect in the Black Dahlia murder, he was also a suspect in the murder of Georgette Bauerdorf from 1944. Uh, that's also in my book. And he was also a suspect in the Cleveland Torso murder case. Hmm. So was it this guy? Hmm, I don't know. Like I said, Black Dahlia, I kind of tend more toward... The doctor hypothesis, just yeah. because of because of her mutilations and, uh, like I said, she wasn't beheaded. Although she did have her um her mouth was cut, yeah. the corners of her mouth were cut all the way to what they call a Glasgow smile, where they cut it all the way to their ears. Yeah, uh, she had that done and uh stuff. But I don't I don't think it was the same person as the Cleveland no. Torso murder. The, it's just the locations are too far distant. It didn't seem like the same motive to me. But, um, you know, who knows? Not the same kind of offender. Yeah. It's not, and, the, same social, not the same social circle either. Right. So. so, I mean, like I said, at this point, since this shit happened in the 1930s, possibly the last crime in the series, maybe 1950, that uh, that guy that was beheaded in Robert Robertson in 1950, that might have been the same guy. But at this point, I mean, that guy, how long ago was that? He's got to be dead by now, right? Yeah. He better be. Sure. <laughs> so I guess we're never really going to figure out like no, this is all unsolved it, stuff. It'll never be solved. Yeah. I don't think this is ever going to be no. solved because it was so long ago. Yeah. You know, like, like the shit, they, they couldn't even identify most of the victims. And if you look in the Cleveland Police Museum, there's, and there's pictures of it on the internet, they've made like death masks of the decapitated heads and stuff they found and they put them though with nobody ever identified. Well, think of, of it people. this way. The guy who did this, the offender, died in obscurity. Yeah. Or he di- when he died, he had no evidence on him. Yeah. So he covered his own tracks. He was, you know, either way. Yeah. If he was a business owner, and he was doing this when he died, there was no, there were, no, there was no physical evidence to connect him to these crimes. So that yeah. means he was very careful. Or he was just another bum dying in obscurity. He had no physical evidence on him. Yeah. To connect him to any of these crimes yeah so no you'll never yeah like i said it must have been something like usually that. when it's a guy who's a sophisticated killer like that you know where he's using a business and he's keeping trophies when he dies he's discovered yeah because they, they find they all, find this all shit. the shit yeah right and they never found that no i still wonder where like the heads and arms and shit that they never found where the fuck did that shit go what did you animals burn got it him. or animals got animals him or got him yeah 
I guess they'll never find any of that shit. Yeah, no. That's pretty creepy. Yeah. This is why I'm fascinated with this kind of yeah. shit, though. Even though this this fucking shit is disgusting. And like I said, I was looking for pictures for, for the YouTube version of the yeah, show. Yeah, you got all kinds of pictures. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. man. Ugh. They're just like fucking headless bodies and yeah. fucking chunks of bodies and shit like that. I mean, at yeah. least they're all in black and white, so it's not super disgusting. Yeah. I'll put them in there anyway, so, you know. <laughs> it just is a warning. All right, so we're getting to the end of the show. Hope you enjoyed this true crime extravaganza and uh remember that my new book the faceless villain which includes this crime the black dahlia georgette bowerdorf many 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 other unsolved murders from 1900 to 1959 yeah it's a big book it's a big book yeah it's like 350 pages it's just like unseen hand yeah and yeah and it's it's a fun you know compilation yeah. and all your favorite unsolved murders are in there and some you may not even know about because i tried to dig deep and find some that weren't so well known and the uh, and then there's two more books to come yeah yeah, in the next volume, I'm. I think this is going to be. I think this is going to be a popular. Book. I'm going to try and get volume two out by spring of yeah. 2018, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that should be out. The print and the ebook should be out. If not by the time the show is up, then at least this week. And then yeah. the audiobook will probably be out in about two weeks. But I'll give everybody a heads up when that goes up. And also. please help us grow the channel. Like, share, and subscribe. Yes. And check us do. out on Patreon. Become yes. A patron. Become a patron of our show and get all kinds of fun stuff. Google Hangouts and yep. free books and stickers and all kinds of neat stuff like that. Also, like I said, if you don't want to give a monthly donation, then you can go to our blog at 13oclockpodcast.wordpress.com and there's a little uh, link there for a PayPal donation. You can give a one-time support, uh, one-time donation if you want to support us that way. And also remember to come see us at Spooky Empire at the end of the month, 27th, 28th, and 29th at the Hyatt Regency Orlando, not the Orange County Convention Center, as I said mm. before, Hyatt Regency Orlando on International Drive. We will be there all three days and we'll be helming the Sick and Twisted panel on Friday night at 9 p.m. And we'll also be on a bunch of other fun horror panels over the weekend. And also, oh, and remember, if you have any scary true stories, paranormal or otherwise, Please send them to gravecake at gmail.com and perhaps they will be featured on our fun Halloween special. I really need some more stories. Yeah, and if you don't if you don't want to write it down, maybe you can contact us on Facebook and maybe we can do it do a video or something. We'll do a new video interview, maybe. Yeah, that, that works way. too. I mean, any yeah. you know, just you as long as I have like a, an audio format, something like that. Because a lot of people don't like to write. Yeah, I know. You know? Yeah, so if you don't want to write it down, or if you have it written down elsewhere and you want to give me a link to it, then that would be cool too. Uh, you know, so hopefully we can have some fun stories to feature on our Halloween special. On our Halloween special. And that will do it for episode 60 of the 13 o'clock podcast. We will see you guys next Tuesday. And the children count to 12. In a schoolyard right they hope will save them from losing their heads, losing themselves.